Koite Arapuru Sounds E ngā reo, e ngā mana, rau rangatira mā, tēnā koutou katoa. You're with the podcast series Sounds Podcasts and an episode called Ross Harris and Klezma for Sounds Centre for New Zealand Music, Toi Te Arapuru, ko Nick Tipping aho. Ross Harris is an Arts Foundation laureate and one of New Zealand's most highly respected composers. In recent years, he's developed a fascination with klezma music. He plays accordion in the Wellington band The Kugels. In this podcast, I chat with Ross about klezma music, the way it's changed him as a composer, and the way it's led him into areas he didn't expect. It's uh, music that really evolved in Eastern Europe, uh, about 18th, 19th century, um, played by uh, Jewish musicians for things like weddings and um, festive events, but very much folk music. It's modal with um, particular kinds of scales which um, use augmented and augmented seconds and diminished fifth, fifths and flattened sevenths and all those unusual scales that we don't find in Western music. It's got a lot of energy actually, it's very passionate music, which is something I've really enjoyed, uh, you know, finding out about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting stuff. I became aware of klezmer music when I was invited by Robin Perks and Debbie Rawson to um, join a klezmer band. And I, it's because I had an accordion, which I'd used in Free Radicals, <laughs> the electronic band, you know, previously. And um, so they said, you've got an accordion, we want to form this band, can you uh, join us? And I didn't even know what klezmer was then, so I don't think I'd really consciously heard anything. And this is like... Um, this is in the 21st century, and it doesn't go back far in, into my youth or anything. I had to look, check out the spelling on the internet, and um, I went along to rehearsal, and I just really loved it. I loved playing the accordion because I'd never really done that much, and uh, it, yeah, I got kind of hooked. I say this kind of passion um, and a, a rather typically Jewish thing of almost simultaneously happy and slightly crazy but also sad and happening at the same time often with the modes making it rather melancholy and perhaps the rhythm and the tempo pushing things along and making them exciting in a different way there's a kind of conflict which I really enjoy actually and when I started to play klezma music I thought these strange little things happening in these awkward corners of pieces. They don't happen in any other music that I know of. I could use that. So then I started to uh, compose stuff and, and be influenced by the klezmer music in, in that respect. Just a little thing. So, but to be quite honest, when my pieces are played by the Kugels in concert, people don't really distinguish between mine and the, tra tra the traditional music. It's um, And yet I haven't really been very uh, academic about trying to figure out what that essence of klezma is, I just went by instinct, composer's instinct. <laughs> I liked being taken out of my sort of comfort zone in kind of areas where I was used to how music would be working and how it would express things. Uh, I was pushed into other areas, which has often happened in my life, actually, when I've tried different genres of music. It's opened up doors in my own music in different ways. So this would be another step along that kind of mm. path as well. Is it a, does it unlock something for you? Yeah, I think it might have, actually, yeah. 
And I, I can't directly say how it's influenced the other pieces that I've written, say for orchestra or you know, string quartet since, but I'm sure it's, it's filtered through. Um, it's a sort of osmosis, really. <laughs> I'm composing, I'm thinking of a klezmer tune, I might play the accordion and improvise and get the essence of something from improvisation. I wouldn't do that on a, a, a complex string quartet because I couldn't play it anyway, so it would be much more intellectual. So I think the klezmer music comes more out of the fingers on, you know, on the machine, on the accordion, um, and then just copying that down and because yeah, I can create the harmony and everything at the same time with the simple instrument that it is. And yeah, so it's it, it just seems like you're walking around the house and suddenly you think of a tune and you start fiddling and that evolves like, you know, somebody composing anything really. I mean, you, you explore ideas, but because they're simple and my accordion playing is limited, um, there's no kind of problem with that. I usually get, get somewhere in the end. <laughs> it feels like quite a visceral style of composition. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because I mean, the art music stuff has become based around computer and, and, and a lot of planning of structures. This, this is in some ways rudimentary, but other, in other ways very complex as well because the relationship between melody and harmony can be really ambiguous. And that's something that I kind of glean from the original Klezmer. I just love that, the possibility of things not going quite the way you expected. And then I could take that a step forward in my own music. There's a melody and a harmony, yep. and then a basic rhythm. Yep. And that's it. That's it. And that's very different from writing a string quartet with counterpoint and complex, you know, compositional uh, working out of ideas. It's much more spontaneous. And both in the composing, which is usually done pretty quickly for me, but also in the fact that it can be interpreted in, in different ways. I like the feel of the kind of freedom, but not complete freedom. It's not like jazz, you know, it's not so, you don't solo in a klezmer band very much, but um, uh, although it depends on the players, obviously it can happen sometimes, but generally it's a, it's a kind of collective thing where everybody's imp improvising a bit all the time. And, and that, that I found really interesting, because I, I not in the end, not all that happy just sitting there playing the notes that somebody else has written, but if it's a, a chord sheet and there's a tune, then I get to make any kind of accompaniment that I want on my little old accordion. Right. And that's fun. I, I think that the idea of a shtetl dance, I mean, the shtetl is a, a small Russian, Ukrainian village or even ghetto. Um, so I just sort of put my mind, and I don't usually do this actually, but I put in mind what that could conceivably be like just for the opening ideas and the feel of the, the tempo and the, um, the way it developed. Um, and it, no, we're not like much development, but then it just sort of takes off and I then start to apply my own kind of chord progressions, which are definitely nothing to do with klezmer, but people don't really seem to notice. They just think it sounds fun. It's not that weird, but a bit bit out of mainstream. And then, of course, the rhythmic uh, dislocations, which throw the beat, which would normally be very steady, would throw them off, off kilter. So it's got surprises at every turn. Um, and then it just builds in a kind of evolution up to a particularly jagged moment rhythmically and then it kind of 
has a climax, I guess, after that, and then folds down and repeats, and then there's a coda at the end. I found the coda quite interesting because it's not something you might see in a klezmer piece of music. No. For me, they build up and up and up. Yeah, yeah. And then, but this one does that, and then all of a sudden it's got this almost whispered coda at the end, hushed. Mm. hushed. Yes. yes. I, think I think there's a little bit of classicism sneaking in there, and also my own sense of humour, which, of course, that it ends with a minor chord when it has just ended with a major chord, and everybody's happy, and then suddenly tagged on the end is another switch to the minor. That's the sort of thing I enjoy doing. For me, the, the end result of, of this piece is it's got almost even more of a mad glint in the eye than regular klezmer music has. Right. I mean, the scales, the modes, you see, is something I've never used in my classical music. It's It'd been much more complex, like all 12 notes in fairly close rotation. And modality seemed to me a little bit of a cop-out, actually. Just, I mean... A few notes, what are you going to do with that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, <laughs> millions of composers have done fantastic stuff. Um, I needed, perhaps, to be forced, because of the klezmer genre, to use those modes and think about them in, in interesting ways. But they are very distinctive, and they do indeed give a strong sense of klezmer presence. How have you dealt with getting to the modes? Like, have you, you said you've been forced into it, but how did you find a way through? Well, I don't even th no, I didn't think about the modes particularly. I thought about the melodic shapes that I was writing that felt that they were klezmer-like, and those were the modes. So it, they were probably at the same time. Uh, not an in, not. I'm going to use this particular scale. Start on the D and have an E flat and then an F sharp. Blah blah blah. And preset that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't ever think like that. But I would start a tune which suddenly would find itself in the area of of a, a klezmer mode, which would come from my listening to klezmer music in, in general. So yeah, I'd pursue that. Um, but then I'd transpose everything, of course. Yep. You know, I'm not going to stay straight into the mode. The, the other element of it is the rhythm, in which in um, still dance is very regular. Yes. And not necessarily like a whole lot of your other compositions. That's true. That's true. I mean, it's a dance, <laughs> even though it'll trip you up. Mm -hmm. uh, but only in one place, really. I mean, it's, pre it's pretty regular. No, um, and that's, I guess, that's why people enjoy it and they like to play it. And um, audiences seem to enjoy listening to it as well. So they're not being given too much. Um, it, it's kind of spontaneous and it's it's out there, but it um, it's, it's got enough complexity for me as well.
one's basically using a genre to which you have no real attachment, so you've got to think about why you're doing it. And I realise that many Jewish artists and art composers like Mahler and Schoenberg and um, comedians like Larry David and um, writers like Daniel Mendelssohn, they're, they're all people whose work I find really interesting, partly because it's a little bit complex. Um, and I, even when I grew up and went to high school, my best friend was a, a Jewish lad. I didn't even know that or know anything about Judaism at that time, but it just seemed to kind of click. And of course, the um, the, the anti-Semitism, which has had such hugely terrible impacts on the history of Western civilization, um, I, I just felt maybe this music that I write is is in some way, some ways, a kind of sense of compassion or um, respect for that world. And um, and and if people find a problem with uh, me doing that, uh, which I haven't found actually, um, then that's a, that's too bad. I, I feel I need to do it. I didn't think we needed a singer, actually. I thought klezmer music is instrumental, but Debbie was quite persistent. And um, as soon as I heard what she could do and that she could sing what I wrote, um, it was incredible. And so I've written my eight or so pieces, which are settings of Yiddish. And um, that's opened a new door altogether, of course. The poem is so so dark and so desperate the violinist is basically somebody who's you know in a concentration camp and, and dying and being killed being going into um, uh, to, to be burnt and um, the violin is very thin and gets thinner and, the, and then the, the player disappears and finally the violin's just all that's left it's, it's a fantastic image of destruction, decay And I can think of all sorts of things I could do with a modernist piece for, you know, string, symphony orchestra or something like that. But it was just the band, and it was just Anna singing beautifully. How could I actually do this? <laughs> Almost seemed impossible to set. So it is really, really simple. Um, and it has this rippling accompaniment in the violin and, and, and clarinet. Um, almost Schubertian changes, actually, rather more than klezmer. Um, and that's all I could do, really. And I, I feel, almost felt, you know, in another, another time and another situation, I might write a completely different piece, which would be much more expressionistic. But because it isn't, I think it actually works anyway. It's slightly paradoxical yeah. because it's actually the violin doesn't disappear, the singer doesn't no. disappear, everything just goes along quite almost mechanically but expressively and then it just stops. Yeah, it's just, it conveys the message rather than trying to dramatise it. That's right. I could have got too hot on the yeah. trail of the emotions. Yeah. So being a little bit, stand, maybe that's a good thing for me sometimes, to step back a bit from from the intensity of the ideas that 
maybe in a poem or that I'm thinking about, mm. just a, a little bit cooler, a little bit more carefully, calmly constructed. When I, I used klezmer tunes in the Third Symphony, which is where they feature most of all, I, I thought of them because they'd been all written and they existed. And I thought, you know, one of the things that classical composers really have done over the centuries is pick up inspiration from folk music. I mean, Mozart, Beethoven, you know, there's, you know, almost everybody, Stravinsky. Um, makes use of material that comes from a more popular, um, Brahms, Hungarian, uh, influence, that sort of thing uh, it sort of adds um, life and almost like a yeast giving uh, life to, to a, a dough um, and I thought well I, I don't have a, a folk music that, go, that I can access but I do have these tunes which are a little bit folk-like in character so I will pretend that they are in fact a folk, folk material and use them in the symphony like that, well that's what I did in that piece maybe that was a dumb idea but anyway it was a way of getting material that had been composed in a completely different way and putting it into a classical complex structure. And that was an interesting experience. There's a lot of darkness in all of my uh, concert music, and so that that's also partly the whole you know influence of the Jewish artists on my life and and work. And um, I feel I feel a need to com communicate those things. And I suppose I'm better at it because I'm such a miserable old bugger. I don't know. <laughs> this podcast was presented and produced. Four Sounds Centre for New Zealand Music, Toi Te Arapuru by me, Nick Tipping, and Phil Brownlee is our sound engineer. Thanks to the following for providing music, Atoll Records, RNZ Concert, the Auckland Philharmonia Orchestra and Marco Latonia, and The Kugels, Debbie Rawson, Anna Gorn, Ross Harris, Robin Perks, and Jacqueline Norden. Thanks to the Stout Trust for funding this podcast. Thanks also especially to our guest, Ross Harris. If you've enjoyed this podcast and would like to support us in making more, please visit the Sounds website and click on the Donate button at the top of the page. And to hear more about the music of Aotearoa New Zealand, go to the Sounds website, sounds.org.nz. That's S-O-U-N-Z. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. Toi te arapuru, sounds.